The fade and group cues are two fundamental elements when building a QLab cue list, and this tutorial will cover the basic functions of each cue and present some different uses for each cue within a cue list. Let's start with the fade cue. The fade cue is always used in conjunction with a target cue, and its purpose is pretty simple. It adjusts the audio output levels from the initial level settings of the target cue to the new level settings of the fade cue over a specified duration of time. A fade's target cue can be an audio, video, or group cue. Cues 2301 and 2302 demonstrate the basic relationship between a fade cue and a target audio cue. Go on cue 2301 to begin the audio cue, and note that this audio cue is set up to loop infinitely at an initial level of 0 dB. Listen to the music for a bit, and then go on cue 2302 at any time. 2302 is a fade cue that's programmed to linearly adjust 2301's master fader from its original level to negative 118 dB over the course of 10 seconds. The fade cue also stops the audio cue playback when the 10 second fade is complete. This simple example demonstrates the core parameters of the fade cue. The target cue, the level settings at the completion of the fade, the duration of the fade, the shape of the fade curve, and the ability to stop the target cue when the fade is complete. Note that when used with a video cue, the fade cue only affects the audio portion of the video cue. Cues 2303 and 2304 demonstrate the use of a fade cue to quickly fade out the audio portion of a video cue. Cues 2305 and 2306 provide an example of a fade cue that targets a group cue, which is a convenient way to fade out an entire group of cues using only one fade cue. We'll be discussing groups in more detail later in this tutorial, but you can see that cue 2305 is a group cue that contains a number of audio cues that play simultaneously to combine into a single piece of music. 2306 targets group cue 2305, so the parameters of fade cue 2306 are applied to all the audio cues contained in cue 2305. You may not always want to apply the settings from one fade cue to an entire group of cues, but it's nice to know that this quick programming option exists. A few common uses for the fade cue are fade outs and fade ins, panning sound between speakers, and ducking the volume of underscoring beneath live dialogue. There are a number of other uses for the fade cue, but we'll be focusing on these applications in this tutorial to help you understand the basics. If you look back at cue 2302, you'll notice that many of the level faders and cross point dials are inactive, which is indicated visually by the controls being dimmed out. Clicking on the level faders and cross point dials will make them active, and note that any level fader or cross point dial that is left inactive will have no effect on the target cue's initial settings. For instance, in Q2302, only the master level fader is active, so even though the level faders for channels 1 and 2 are at the bottom of the fader display, the levels for channels 1 and 2 will remain at their initial settings while the master level fades out. Note that if the level faders for channels 1 and 2 were also active, the perceived fade time would decrease significantly because you'd be simultaneously fading out both the individual channels and the master level. Cues 2301 through 2306 all demonstrate the use of a fade cue as a manually triggered cue, which is very useful for live productions when timing flexibility is required. However, fade cues can also be programmed to go automatically if a specific start time for the fade is desired. Go on cue 2307 and note that the fade cue is now programmed to automatically begin after the audio cue plays through the loop one time. If we take a closer look at the parameters of the fade cue, you'll notice a number of familiar settings. Much like an audio cue requires a target audio file, a fade cue requires a target audio, video, or group cue in order to function. When you drop a new fade cue into a cue list, it will have a red X next to it until a target cue has been assigned and a level adjustment has been made. The red X is QLab's standard way of telling you that there's a problem. Either the fade cue doesn't have a target to act upon, or the fade cue isn't making any adjustments to its target cue, which is good to know when programming the cue list. Also, since the fade cue in 2307 is fading out the audio, there's no need to continue playing the target cue's audio once the fade is complete, so notice that the stop target when done option is checked. This parameter does exactly what it says. It stops the playback of the target cue when the duration of the fade is complete. Another important parameter is the fade cue's curve shape, which is located in the curve shape and settings tab of the inspector. The curve shape graphic display allows you to customize the way that levels are modified by the fade cue, and notice that you can define separate fade up and fade down shapes for each fade cue. The curve shape for cue 2302 is the default linear fade, which will fade the audio from its initial level to its ending level at a constant rate. However, you can easily create custom curves for the fade, as demonstrated by the curves found in the fade cues for 2307 and 2308. 
Simply click in the curve display to add a curve control point and drag it to adjust the curve shape. To delete a control point, click on it and press delete. Adding additional control points allows you to manipulate the shape in many ways. You can create all kinds of crazy curve shapes, but I typically find the default linear curve or a simple logarithmic curve to be the most useful. The ability to customize curves is an important tool when striving to create smooth fadeouts, pans, and crossfades. Speaking of smooth fades, let's use cues 2309, 2310, and 2311 to demonstrate some issues and tips when using fades. Our goal in each of these cues is the same, to get the music to pan smoothly from the left speaker to the right speaker. All of these cues are set up in a similar way. A target audio cue has the channel 1 level fader up so that the music is only in the left speaker. And then, after a 6 second pre-wait, a fade cue adjusts the levels to bring up the right speaker and fade out the left speaker. Take a look at the levels and settings tabs for the audio and fade cues in 2309 and notice that things are set up in a fairly straightforward manner. The left and right channels of the audio file are routed to QLAP channels 1 and 2 respectively, the audio cue level faders are set up to start the music in the left speaker, and the fade cue level faders are set up to turn down the left speaker and turn up the right speaker linearly over a 5 second duration. Everything looks like it should work just fine. But if you go on Q2309, you'll notice two problems. First of all, the volume level fades out almost completely during the pan. And secondly, while the sound does move from left to right after the volume dip in the middle, the music mix in each speaker sounds very different. Most noticeably, there is significantly more reverb on the drums in the right speaker. Let's address this second issue first. While it's very common to discreetly route the left and right channels of a stereo audio file to respective left and right speakers in a sound system, in this case, we're using a stereo audio file while trying to achieve the effect of a mono sound source that moves from one speaker to the other. Therefore, we need to route the same amount of the audio file's left and right signals to both QLab channels. Take a look at the audio cue cross points in 2310 and you'll see that this has been done. Also notice that the cross point feeds from each input have been backed off an equal amount in order to prevent any overloading of the QLab channels. Now both QLab channels will be fed the same mono mix from the stereo audio file. Going back to Q2309, let's address the volume drop in the middle of the fade. The cause of this issue really boils down to two factors, the linear shape of the fade curve, and the fact that in this tutorial workspace there is a 120 decibel difference between 0 dB, which can also be referred to as unity gain, and the full off position of the level faders. That's a pretty wide dynamic range. As the fade cue in 2309 starts to kick in, it's fading out the left channel from unity at the same rate that it's fading in the right channel from negative 120 dB. The level in the left channel drops quickly and very noticeably long before the right channel has had a chance to reach a level that can even be heard. Therefore, we hear a very noticeable volume drop in the middle of the pan. We'll talk more about the wide dynamic range in a bit, but for now look at how cues 2310 and 2311 use nonlinear fade curve shapes to refine the left to right panning effect. There was still a slight volume dip during the fade in 2310, so additional curve control points were added to the curve in 2311 to bring up the right speaker level a bit faster, thus creating a more fluid panning effect. Q2312 achieves the exact same result as 2311, but instead of adjusting the level faders, the fade cue in 2312 adjusts the cross point dials. While I almost always use fade cues to adjust level faders, it is handy to keep in mind that they can also be used to adjust input and cross-point matrix dials. Note that the 120 dB difference between the fader's unity gain position and the full off position is specific to this tutorial workspace. It's not the default setting in QLab. However, the principle of using fade curves and dynamic range awareness to create smooth fades still applies to any situation. The previous examples demonstrate why it's useful to keep in mind how fades interact with the maximum and minimum levels. If you go to the Audio Preferences window, you'll notice a section called Volume Limits. This section is pretty self-explanatory, allowing you to set a cap on the maximum allowed audio output and a minimum threshold that will be considered negative infinity. Though I don't typically mess with these settings, the minimum volume limit does bring up an interesting issue related to fades, which is the audible threshold of an audio cue through the sound system. Play cues 2313 and 2314 and listen carefully to each fade out. Both fade cues are set up exactly the same, except for the level faders. In 2313, a large portion of the 15 second fade is occurring at volume levels that are well below the audible threshold of most sound systems. And the resulting effect is that instead of being a fairly smooth sounding 15 second fade out, it sounds more like an abrupt 6 or 7 second fade out. 
However, in 2314, the level is only fading out to negative 65 dB, which is near the bottom of my sound system's audible threshold. Now the fade has less distance to cover over the 15 seconds, so the result is a much more gradual sounding fade out. Most of the time, I have one QLab channel feeding each speaker in the sound system, so once I've calibrated the system to be as loud as I need at each QLab channel's unity position, I often use a track from a rock CD to identify the audible threshold for each speaker. I like to use a well-recorded rock song because they're typically mastered to be fairly loud and compressed files, but there's still enough variation in the music to make it easier to identify than pink noise at very low volumes. I make a note of the threshold level for each channel, and then when I'm setting levels on fadeouts, I can use those values to help create smoother fades with less hassle. Although system calibration is a long topic for another day, use Q2315 to roughly identify the audible threshold of your sound system. You'll probably find that it's well above the bottom position of the level faders. Q2316 to 2319 demonstrate a very common use for fades, which is to duck down the volume level of a Q so that live dialogue can be heard above it and then bring the level back up once the dialogue is complete. Notice that only Q2319 stops the audio cue playback. This is a good time to point out that any number of fade cues can be added to a cue list and share the same target cue. Each newly triggered fade cue will simply apply its parameter settings to the target cue's current volume level. And this leads us right into a discussion of absolute versus relative fades. Notice that in the Curve Shape and Settings tab, you can select the fade type to be either absolute or relative. The default is absolute, and although I typically use absolute fades, it's important to understand the difference between the two fade types, because they each have advantages that work well in certain situations. One simple key to understanding the difference between absolute and relative fades is to think of absolute fades as fades that adjust levels to a specific dB level, whereas relative fades adjust levels by a specific dB level. Looking at cues 2316 to 2319, which use absolute fades, you'll see that the levels in 2316 begin at 0 dB, Q2317 then brings the levels down to negative 18 dB, 2318 brings the levels back up to 0 dB, and finally 2319 takes the levels to negative infinity and stops playback. So the level settings for the audio cue and three fade cues in sequence are 0, negative 18, 0, and negative infinity. Notice that this exact sequence of values is used for the audio and fade cues in 2320 to 2323. But the outcome is very different because the fade cue types are set to relative as opposed to absolute. Therefore, the levels in 2320 begin at 0 dB, Q2321 adjusts the levels down by negative 18 dB, 2322 adjusts the levels by 0 dB, and oh, there's our problem. Using a relative fade to adjust the levels by 0 dB will not change the levels at all. Therefore, the level simply stays at negative 18 dB until the next cue fades it out completely. Cues 2324 to 2327 use relative fades correctly, bringing the levels down by negative 18 dB and then back up by plus 18 dB before fading out. As I mentioned before, I tend to be more comfortable using absolute fades, but cues 2328 to 2331 illustrate the usefulness of relative fades. If you wanted to change the overall level of some underscoring, including the ducking, you only need to adjust the target cue's initial level settings if the fade cues are relative fades. One last time-saving tip regarding fades. If you ever want to copy just the level settings from one cue to another, you can use Shift-Command-C to copy the levels, and Shift-Command-V to paste the levels. I use this all the time to copy levels between audio cues and also from target cues to their fade cues. Now let's turn our attention to another fundamental cue in QLab, the group cue. Group cues are essentially just folders in which you can place other cues. However, their usefulness shouldn't be underestimated. They're incredibly valuable for keeping your cue list organized, and in certain situations, they're vital for keeping the cue list running correctly during a performance. You can drag and drop any number of cues into a group, and then collapse and expand the group by clicking on the triangle icon on the left side of the group's name. You can also use the left and right arrow keys to collapse and expand the selected group, or use the shift plus lesser than and greater than keys to collapse and expand all the groups in the queue list. Also note that a group in all of its internal queues will function exactly the same whether the group is collapsed or expanded. So collapsing groups can be a useful way to reduce the amount of visual clutter that a board op sees, if that's what they prefer. The only parameter for the group queue is the mode of the group, which is found in the mode tab of the inspector. 
The mode of a group determines the way in which the cues within the group are fired, and the name of each of the four modes pretty much tells you how each one will function. Notice that you can change the default mode for new groups added to the queue list by going to the Group Preferences window. Also note that the border of the group is slightly different for each mode so that you can visually identify a group's mode without checking the inspector. Let's take a look at a few examples to demonstrate each mode. Q2332 uses the fire first child and enter into group mode. And if you go on Q2332, you'll see that it immediately fires the first Q in the group and then moves the playback position to the next Q within the group, One. which could also be referred to as the next child in the group. This is the simplest mode, and I find that it's the mode that I use most often. Typically, I'll string together all of the children cues within a group with autocontinues so that the group queue fires off a number of related elements. And as you've probably noticed throughout this tutorial workspace, this mode is also very useful for basic visual organization of cues. For example, all of the cues in this queue list have been organized into various groups in such a way that the entire queue list can be collapsed into only two groups. If you just want to group cues together by act or scene, this is the mode to use. Q2333 uses the fire first child and go to next Q mode. And if you go on Q2333, you'll see that it fires the first child of the group just like the first mode. However, instead of moving the playback position to the next child Q within the group, the playback position moves to the next Q after the group. This is a significant difference and can be very useful when there is some more sophisticated programming occurring within the group. Without the ability to move on to the next Q, the playback position could potentially get stuck in the first group, waiting for those elements to wrap up. The Fire All Children Simultaneously mode is demonstrated in Q2334. It does exactly what you would expect, firing all of the cues within the group at the same time and then moving the playback position to the next cue after the group. Three. The fourth mode is Fire Random Child and Go to Next Cue. Three. If you go on Q2335 a number of times, you should notice this random One. behavior. As I mentioned before, I typically use the first group mode in combination with auto continues to fire all the children cues with one go. While this might seem to be the same as using the fire all children simultaneously mode, there's an important difference, which leads us into a discussion of absolute versus relative timelines. Q2336 is set up the way that I usually use groups, and it provides an example of a relative timeline. The first child fires, and since it auto continues to the next cue, the second child begins its pre-wait countdown immediately. When the pre-wait is complete, the second child fires, which once again triggers the next child's pre-wait. It's very much like a string of dominoes that fall one after the other. If there were no pre-waits, they would all fire at the same time. But as soon as the 0.7 second pre-waits are added, it becomes apparent that the firing of each cue is directly related to when the previous cue is fired, thus the concept of a relative timeline. If you go on Q2337, you'll hear the exact same result counting from 1 to 4. However, notice that the pre-waits for each of the children are different multiples of 0.7 seconds. This is because in the fire all children simultaneously mode, all of the children cues are fired at the exact same time, and therefore the pre-waits are only related to the initial go of the group queue, not the other children cues in the group. Using this kind of absolute timeline can be useful if you know what specific times you want the children cues within the group to fire in relation to that initial go. In both of these examples, the outcome is the same, but there's just a slight variation in how you think about the triggering that occurs within the group. Experiment with the different modes, and you'll find a way of working with them that's most comfortable for you. I'd like to wrap up this tutorial by sharing some recommendations about using groups. Refer to the Act 1 Organization Sample section at the end of this cue list for an example of how I often lay out my cues for a show. I found it useful to designate a group cue for every go in a production that needs to be triggered by the board op. So when I start building my QLab queue list, I create a whole bunch of empty group queues and then number and name them according to the queue information that I've been sharing with the stage manager and director. Any queue for which the stage manager needs to call go will be a group queue. Then, as I build the content for the show, I just fill in the groups with whatever elements each queue needs, whether it be only one audio queue or a whole sequence of audio and fade queues. You never know when you'll need to add or subtract elements from a called queue, so having everything in groups from the very beginning gives you plenty of flexibility while also keeping your queue list organized, which is a big deal if the show requires a couple hundred called queues, each with multiple elements. Notice that I sometimes nest groups within groups in order to organize queue elements within a single called queue. This is especially useful for fading out dry and reverbed queue elements at different rates, which is a technique that I often use on fadeouts. This approach to organizing queues has proven to work very well for me, but as always, feel free to find your own way of working in QLab. There aren't any rules.